Hello and welcome back. This video is a continuation of an interview I did with Craig Marshall, who is a transformational coach, motivational speaker, yogi, and former monk of Self-Realization Fellowship. In part two of this series, Craig takes us deeper into the art of transformation and coping with changes in life. He explores deeper facets of introspection, magnetism, and creativity. All this and more, coming up. When I have conversations with people, you talk about transitions. I start off asking this question, which is the most intriguing thing of all, I think. If we were to go back in a time machine a thousand years to the year 1000, and we got out, say in Europe, and we're looking around in the middle, middle ages, we'd say, wow, this is a, a tough time. It's cold, it's gritty, it's dirty, there's marauders around, it isn't safe. They don't have much technology or methodology, and they're just sort of banging around in life, you know? And we would ask ourselves, how did these people make it through the week? You know, this was, this was a challenging time. Well, okay, suppose we got back in our time machine and we went ahead a thousand years to the year 3000. We got out and we're talking to those people and we're looking back at our time around the year 2000. I think we would say, look at those people. They were so stressed and fragmented and chasing around and just perpetual stress in their lives. It's so unnatural. How in the world did those people make it through the week? Don't you think we would say that? Yeah, absolutely. And so if that's the case, and I think it's pretty obvious, what would be, and this is the bingo question, what would be, the next learning that mankind will master that will allow it to work more in tune with the laws of life and get more dynamic results with less effort. So there's a cool factor, you know, there's a mastery to it instead of grinding and, and banging around and um, just letting life be a slog where you're looking forward to happy hour or thank God it's Friday, you know? And so, and so I think, Understanding these laws of magnetism and creativity are so exciting now because I'm living a completely different life than I was even five years ago. Can you imagine? And of course, I learned a lot in the ashram. I learned about Indian thought and meditation, and I was living a life of service, and it was very supportive on many, many levels. But still, I was making that effort because I was too immature. I wasn't really ready to to approach mastery and not that I'm in any shape or form a master, but I am heading in that direction. And I don't know whether it's just age. I don't know whether there's a pain quota that you reach. <laughs> you go, I've had enough. I'm up to here. It's like, you know, I'm willing to try something different. And so, um, you know, I, 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 I think we all have visions, even, even, even companies have visions and, uh, uh, I remember once reading about this Nordstrom department store and their mission statement was to give people the most compelling shopping experience possible. Isn't that something? And like this uh, chain pharmacy, CVS, that's that just bought out Aetna a few weeks ago. It's this huge, huge company now. And their mission statement was to be the, the easiest retail pharmacy for people to use. That's a bold statement the easiest retail pharmacy and even amazon you know amazon existed for you know, what 15 or 20 years without making a profit they were just building and building and building and putting all their money back into their developing infrastructure and their goal all along their primary purpose was to be the earth's most customer centric company wow i mean these are these are wild ideas aren't they yeah. And so to what degree they're able to pull this off, you know, is, is another question. But in our personal lives, I think having that clarity, those marching orders, what am I all about? What is my primary driver? What gets me up in the morning is so, is so really, really important to be conscious of. Because I don't know if you've ever heard it said, Joey, but I heard this many, many years ago. And they said, 
you are the average of the five people that you're around the most. And when I heard that, I thought about it for just a minute. And my <laughs> next thought was, I need to swap out a couple of people. <laughs> and it was true. Yeah, we probably all do. I think so, because this goes back to what Jack Welch was doing, you know, of cutting that 10% off from the bottom every year. I think that we are around some people, I wouldn't call them energy suckers, you know, that's, that's a pretty judgmental thing, but yet we're just not in tune with them the way we used to be. And people do grow in different directions over time. And some people are moving into new chapters, other people are getting stuck and on and on. So it's like, it's worth thinking about who, who are the five people that I'm around the most, you know, and what is the average of that? And I know that this New Year's Eve, a couple of months ago in January, um, my wife and I spent several hours doing a, an appreciation list of what we really were grateful for during the preceding year of 2017. And when you do something like that, it's like a, a shocking experience because you realize we accomplished so much we have so much to be grateful for that we're taking for granted. So I started listing these things down. We started categorizing these things. And one of the things that popped up was our friendships. So we started categorizing our friendships. Well, who are we around? Some people, just because of geography, we live closer, you know? So what are the groups that you have? Are they your golf buddies or your drinking buddies or your old school buddies or, you know, these different environments? And again, this is not a judgment. There's no right or wrong with this. It's just, it's about influence, you know? And our time is limited. So who do we want to be around? And that goes back to the question of, of, of why. You know, why am I living my life? And if I have certain goals, then certain people are going to support those goals more than others. And I can help them, right? So there's an interaction. So in this new year of 2018, we set some goals because we wanted to be around more conscious people. So we started to make a list. And again, this is not judgmental. This is just a, a feel thing, you know, of like, who do you want to be around and why? So we made this list and we started calling those people and connecting with them. And it's like a spiral now. It's just magic because um, I'm, we ended up making New Year's resolutions that had to do with our relationships, career, of course, financial goals, and personal development. And so um, that's why things are speeding up so fast for us now is because we're really working all of these. You know, it's like it's not an effort, but it's like we're thoughtful about these things. Right. Right. Now that's. That's amazing. Thanks for sharing that, Craig. That I, I also wanted to talk to you a little bit about, uh, so we talked about the value of introspection and really understanding your life purpose and working in harmony with it. We talked about the role of meditation and how that assists in maybe softening the ego. Could you talk a little bit more about one of the other obstacles, at least that I've struggled with, is fear. Okay, So fear of embracing the new and letting go of you know our comfort zone stepping out of our comfort zone most of the growth that i've had on a personal level has been when i've stepped out of my comfort zone and can you talk a little bit more about the role of fear and how we can work with with fear rather than against it well that's that's another great question joey because fear is sort of uh, the sidekick of all heroes you know <laughs> And, and, and the way I see it is like, um, if you can imagine, there's a river. And on one side of the river is an old fashioned medieval kind of walled city with these concentric circles of walls, right? Like in the medieval times, people built those cities for protection, right? So if you live within those walls, um, probably the marauders or the enemy isn't going to get you. You have a certain amount of safety because of the height and the strength of those walls and your, 
you're set up with your weapons to protect yourself. Um, however, the price to be paid for living in a walled city is that naturally there's going to be kind of a group think that develops, right? And so there's not going to be that learning and growing simply because there isn't that culture of expansion and interface with other cultures, right? So that's just the price you pay. <clears throat> now, once in a while, however, coming into your wall city is some sort of troubadour or visitor from foreign lands, right? And they're telling you stories about other places and other people who are playing the game differently. And there's all sorts of opportunities and it sounds romantic and adventurous. And it's like, that's what the movies are all about, right? Is these far flung experiences that are outside of the walls of our personal experience. So depending on your, your karma, you know, you might go outside the wall city one day, walk down to the river and you look across and on the other side of the river to you is what you might call wilderness, right? I mean, it's the unknown, you know? And so if you are drawn to that, you might, you know, find somebody who has a boat or rig something to go across the river and just uh, explore a little bit. And then you run back to your boat and you come back to the wall city and you go, it's really interesting. There's animals out there that I had not met. And I, I hiked up to the top of this mountain and I could really see a long way in the distance. And, you know, it really is intriguing. There's a call there. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of like life is that we came to do certain things in life and have certain experiences. And the question is, are you doing that? And it may be to stay in the wall city and, and you can be happy there and you can, serve there and, and you can do a lot of valuable things inside that city. But if you're intrigued by something outside those walls, you know, you're going to be conflicted. And I think that's the heroic journey that Joseph Campbell mapped out in all of his work. And uh, his original book, I think was published like in 1947 and it was called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And he studied world mythology. And he came to understand that all these different cultures are basically telling their kids the same stories. Different characters, different scenarios, but fundamentally there is these archetypal stories which are core to the whole human species. And he mapped those out. And so he wrote these stepping stones. This is the step here. And, and most of the classic movies over the last 40 years have been made according to that matrix that Joseph Campbell spelled out. And the first step is that you have to leave the safety and security of the known. You have to leave the walled city. So like in the Lord of the Rings, the hobbits have to leave the safety and cushy little life of their shire, which was great. They're eating six times a day. They have this cozy little existence. They're smoking their little pipes and having their little fun. But certain ones like Bilbo and Frodo, they're called, you know, to leave and go out on this quest. And of course, then they're gonna meet a, a guru or a guide. And then at a certain point, you know, the guru is gonna disappear. And you go through this transformation where you realize it's not just the blessing of your teacher, but within you, you have something besides the magic wand, which is going to get lost somewhere in the journey. And you find that you have within you this extra power, this intuitive inspiration, and you learn how to touch that. And that is basically you maturing into the, the hero rather than being the little person. And so that's the journey of life. It's archetypal. We all are dealing with it in different ways, in our career, in our relationship. So that perpetual growth is always there and every step requires transitions. But as you said, fear is always gonna be there. So it's like just managing it. And I was watching a, a, a movie uh, on Netflix recently and it was, I forget the name of it, it was a lady's name and it's a true story and she was um, autistic and uh, her mother got her into certain schools and she was able to find a niche in life. And it was about uh, the handling of cattle and who were 
in farmyards, you know, and how they could be treated more humanely and what their fears were. And that was her little niche in life. And so she had to overcome so many fears. And she said one time, I, cause she, she saw in pictures, you know, she didn't understand certain, certain cues in life, but she could see visual things. She said, whenever I'm challenged and I get scared, I just see it as a doorway that I can walk through. And when I walk through the door, everything's going to change. So whenever she would go into these panic attacks, you know, she would just visualize a door there. So silly little, little things like that allow us to like face those fears and move forward because, you know, I know all about fear. When I was in the third grade, I was afraid of the fourth grade. When I was in the fourth grade, I was afraid of the fifth grade. You know, you know, you get involved in sports. You're never the best. There's always somebody better. You're afraid you don't have what it takes, you know, and, and, and it goes on and on and on. But corollary to fear is this concept I call circumstantial living. And, and most of us have lived like this most of our lives because this is the way everybody else plays the game, you know, but I, I, I'm getting out of that. I'm opting out of this. And the, the, the premise underneath circumstantial living is that if I accomplish X, Y, and Z, I'll be happy. So when we're young, it's like, well, when I get through school, I'll be happy, you know, and then well, when I find the right guy or girl, I'll be happy, you know, and then, you know, when I have the house on the hill, you know, your dream house, I'll be happy. And then it's like, well, I'll be happy when I get the kids through school, you know, <laughs> it never ends because the premise is that, is that these activities and these accomplishments will lead to happiness. And I no longer subscribe to that. I think it's almost the opposite where it's like when I'm happy within and choose to be really joyous is the word, not happy, you know, I will magnetically set up a field around me that will attract the things that I want, you know, but it's not conditioned on circumstances. So fundamentally at our point in human development, I think we have these two core things inverted, you know, cause and effect are mixed up circumstance and fulfillment you know and so this is why i was drawn to being a monk and it's not really about living in a monastery how many people can go sit in a monastery and you know renounce all their their responsibilities that's just one road to rome monastic life so it's not about monastic life but it is about monistic life meaning meaning one pointedness or, or focus you know and now the red thread through my life, which represents that monos, is being conscious, is being aware, which involves facing fears, which involves taking next steps, which involves unlearning, right? Mm -hmm. And these, these core things. And when you shift those things on that level, everything outside changes. And that's what I teach in my consulting, is this is a, a, a several step process and I know that, that anybody who's listening to this is resonating with it because we're all the same. You know, this is, this is a, like a facts of life lecture. There's, there's not opinions about this. This is just how it works, you know. And then we have to understand how am I going to plug these things into my life that are going to give me a deeper fulfillment, allow me to be more in tune with my personal life purpose, and be more successful personally and professionally. These are, these are generic questions, right? Yeah. And I think there is a science to it. And that's some of the things we're talking about. Wow. That's, that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Craig. I, you know, just listening to you again, I could listen to you for hours, but just listening to you again, um, you know, as you're asking all of these questions, they're sort of going through my mind as well. And I'm trying to, you know, go through that whole introspection process. Um, you know. Well, they're going through my mind too, Joey. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not teaching. I'm, I'm blessed because I teach what I want to learn. And I really don't even teach because I'm just a facilitator because I, I honestly believe that we all have the answers within us, you know? And so I just help people bring those answers forward because if we were smart, if we were really smart, Joey, we would reverse engineer our lives and we would like imagine ourselves lying in a hospital. We're 90 some years old and we're at the end 
And we would be asking ourselves, what regrets don't I want to have, you know? And I've seen many lists of the primary regrets of dying people, but the most coherently expressed I've ever seen is these three things. Number one, and this is across the board, people say, I didn't live true to myself, meaning they took jobs or they were in relationships which weren't true to themselves. Isn't that sad? That's regret number one. Number two is obvious. I wish I hadn't worked so hard, you know? Work, 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 work. And number three is very curious because they say it like this. I wish I had let myself be happier. Not I wish I had been happier. I wish I had let myself. I didn't allow myself to be happy. Isn't that wild? Wow. These are profound things. And I was thinking about all this stuff even when I was a kid. And that's why I became a monk. And I still think I'm, I'm more monistic than ever because I'm more focused on these core things and really lining up my thoughts, my feelings, my activities, my friendships, my, my whole way of life with these core things. And, uh, you know, this probably isn't for kids. You know, you have to have a certain level of maturity and, and awareness uh, to commit to this. But once we do, it's like it can go vertical. I mean, I know a lot of people whose lives are, are really on the move. And that's very exciting. And I want to be around people like that. And I consider you one of those people, Joy. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. That, that means a lot to me, Craig. And so if, if people want to get in touch with you, what I'm going to do is uh, on this YouTube, on the YouTube video description, I'll list your contact info, your website. Um, people can reach out to you by email or call you or uh, even through Facebook. Um, so. Sure. Yeah. I'm uh, my, my uh, consulting website is just craigmarshallconsulting.com or they can even text me um, at 323-514-7034. And I'm happy to get back to people because I really, um, I've learned a lot. I'd like to share that. And I also learn from everybody I talk to, too. So it really is a, a collaboration. And I'm very excited about what's going on in the world because, you know, as a lot of old institutions are kind of phasing out or dying, a lot of new things are being born these days. And it's extraordinary. And one of my recent uh, ventures is something called Peace City. You can check it out on Facebook. And it is. Uh, a community. It is a, a television station. It is an online university, and it's dedicated to both learning and unlearning. And then also, it's a virtual reality, so people can put on trade shows, edit films, uh, build your dream house. This is a, a whole new world that people can connect in a really deep and experiential way. So I'm I'm super excited every single day. Oh, that sounds very exciting. I'm definitely going to be looking into that. And uh, we will probably have you again on this show if you're willing. And um, thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart, Craig. Great to be with you, Joey. Okay, bye for now. Take care. Hey, guys. Hope you enjoyed this interview. What did you like the most about it? Uh, please leave me a comment below. I'd love to hear from you. Also, do you want to hear more about when I create more videos like this? If so, please be sure to subscribe. Thanks and have a blissful day.